before introducing our speaker, we don't, do want to remind everyone that the open forum will be coming up after this lesson. We do have sheets available on the front if you have a question that you would like to submit for the open forum. Uh, please do so. Uh, give that to me or one of the elders or David. We'll make sure that uh, Michael Hatcher gets that. He will be conducting the open forum today. We also have a sign-up sheet in the front on this table in front of me uh, for the DVDs or the CDs. If you are interested in that, the information is on the paper. Uh, put your name and address on it, and we'll make sure that you get those at the appropriate time. Brother Ralph Rubner was scheduled to speak for us this time, but uh, due to a conflict, Brother Paul Vaughn will be speaking for us today. I uh, look forward to hearing him. Brother Paul Vaughn was born in Maysville, Kentucky. He married Ricky Jett in 1973. Paul and Ricky have worked in the mission field in Ohio and Kentucky for the past 22 years. Uh, he has helped establish congregations in Brown County, Ohio, Jackson, Kentucky, and are, they're presently working for the Hallsville Church of Christ in Hallsville, Kentucky. Did I say that right? Or is it Hayes? Hallsville? Okay. This congregation was established in 2000, February of 2000. Paul attended the Maysville Community College in Lexington Technical Institute in uh, Lexington Institute. In 1984, he entered the East Tennessee School of Preaching in Knoxville, Tennessee, he graduated there in 1986. We are glad to have Paul with us today, and we look forward to his lesson that he'll be presenting for us. Uh, Paul, come speak to us. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you, and I'm thankful for David and the elders to invite me. I appreciate Brother Rufter for trading places with me. I thank that. Thank him very greatly for that. And I'm going to be a little bit different than the rest of you. I'm glad that David signs me this book because I want to know what they teach so I can refute it. And I'm glad he's assigned you books. I don't have to read those books. All I have to do is go to the lectureship book and see how you've done it. <laughs> so I appreciate that very much. I'm also not going to be giving you the lesson that's in the book. It's not going to happen, so just close the book up. I'll touch on part of it. And I asked David about this a few weeks ago. So David, I want to take the lesson in a different direction. And we'll just go with it from there. I want to thank the Stevens for putting up with us. We appreciate them very greatly, very, very kind and gracious hosts. The study of the Restoration history is vital. It's important to all of us. In fact, without an accurate study of Restoration history, you would not know if the things in the one book a bicentennial celebration of Thomas Campbell Declaration Address, if it is accurate or not. This is why we need to study Restoration history. Now, with this in mind, I want to put a peg there and use an illustration. Many of our brethren have debated Bob Ross, a Baptist. And in those debates, Bob Ross accused our brethren of being Campbellites. Can you imagine such a thing? He has no concept of New Testament Christianity. But if he would ever debate these guys and he called them Campbellites, well, they consider that a compliment. Because that's exactly what they are. After finishing my manuscript, I asked one of the members of the church to, to proof it for me, and I, I gave him the book, and I said, here, you can check my quotes and go through it. He read the manuscript, and he decided to read the book real quick. It's only around 125 pages. He says, those people think more of Campbell than they do the Word of God. And I said, you're right. You're right. Now, when we think about this book, The One Church, the Bicentennial Celebration of Thomas Campbell's Declaration Address, that there are two important documents in Restoration history. The last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery that was signed by Barton W. Stone, Robert Marshall, John Dunleavy, Richard McNamara, Tom, John Thompson, and David Provice on June 28, 1804. 
And then the Declaration of Address written by Thomas Campbell on August 17, 1809. Now, I want to say something else. This is the first edition. In other words, this is the one that Thomas Campbell wrote. They have four uh, revisions, and they're working on a fifth. If you really want to know what he wrote, go to the Internet and print out the first edition. I didn't read the second, third, and fourth, and I, I don't know if I'll ever read the fifth, but I have a feeling that they've kind of doctored up the declaration address a little bit too. So let's just be wise when you're going and, and doing this and make sure that you're getting the one that Campbell wrote. Now I know the second edition was probably uh, straightening out grammatical errors and spelling and things like that, but when you go to the third and fourth and maybe a fifth, there's something wrong there somewhere. They keep, have to keep revising the declaration address. But of the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery, it was written to put to death an odd scriptural organization, the Springfield Presbytery. Like the last will and testament, these men got together. They realized that, that this organization that they were part of was not in the word of God, so they just put it to death. The last will and testament of Springfield Presbytery. The declaration and address was written to establish an unscriptural organization. The declaration and address was written to establish an unscriptural organization. And I quote, at a meeting held at Buffalo, August the 17th, 1809, consisting of persons of different religious denominations to form themselves into a religious association, page two. Then on page four, that we form ourselves into a religious association under the denomination of the Christian Association of Washington. Now they're forming a unscriptural organization. That's why the declaration address was written. In fact, those in the group that, uh, that Campbell was with, uh, some of them from different uh, uh, denominations, and they're writing this to form this organization. Now, what can we learn, though, from the Declaration Address? Now, I want to say this right off the bat. Those Restoration leaders were giants. And don't ever forget it. Now, I'm going to show some error in Thomas Campbell. But I respect him in the fact that he was reading himself out of error. He was not blessed like we are to have someone come and teach us the pattern for New Testament Christianity. He was not blessed like we are for someone to come and teach him the pattern uh, for salvation and the oneness of the church. But he began to read himself out of error but yet at the time of the Declaration Address, he was still a Presbyterian. He claimed to be a Presbyterian. In fact, he was an Olight and a Burger Succeeder Presbyterian. Olight's a question of Solemn League and Covenant should be the made a term of communion. And a Burger considered the oath of binding people to support religious practice in that realm. And then a Seceder was succeeded from the Scottish Presbyterians over appointment of preachers. Now, Campbell was indoctrinated deeply into denominationalism. That's all he knew. That's what he was brought up in. And at this stage in time, as a fledgling nation, he moves over here to America, and he is, gets a rude awakening on some issues, and thus he writes the Declaration and Address. He had been rejected by the Seceder Presbyterian Church, no speaking appointments, he would go out, and when he came to America, he would go out, he'd preach, and he did some things they didn't like, so they just wouldn't give him any speaking appointments. He made his separation from secederism on September 13, 1809. He rejected much of their doctrine, stating that the Holy Scriptures were all sufficient. And this is where he began to take steps, or at least one of the documented places where he began to take steps back to New Testament Christianity. At a meeting at the house of Abram Alters, Campbell said, where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. And by the way, that was not original with Campbell. It wasn't. 
I had a debate in Ohio with a Christian church preacher, and I used where the Bible speaks, we speaks, and where the Bible is silent, we are silent. He says, you got that from Campbell. No, I did not. I got it from the guy that taught me about going to the Bible long before I ever heard of Campbell. And I was very honest with him that I don't think he believed me, but basically all it is is, is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, Amen. speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. But that statement was not original with Campbell. Thomas Campbell was growing, but he had a long way to go. When he wrote the Declaration of Ad uh, Declaration of Address, you must say that he only had an immature, childlike view of New Testament Christianity. Very immature, childlike view. And this is where we're getting into, because I want to do a... Uh, study of the Declaration Address before we actually look at some of the things that's put forth in this book. And some of the brethren was talking about hermeneutics and the new hermeneutics. Guess what? The seed for the new hermeneutic is in the Declaration Address. As the seed for the American Christian Missionary Society is in the Declaration of Address. Also as the seed for New Testament Christianity is in the Declaration of Address. The seed's there. All you have to do is plant, decide on what seed you want to plant. The Declaration and Address, we want to look at some principles, some restoration principles in Declaration and Address, and then I'm going to look at some uh, denominational principles in Declaration and Address. And by the way, the address itself is 28 pages, and then there's appendix to go out to about 70 pages. Okay. So we'll look at both the address and the appendix. Declaration Address, the restoration principles in the Declaration Address. We are, are we not all praying for that happy event when there shall be but one fold as there is but one chief shepherd? What shall we pray for a thing and not strive to obtain it? That's a wonderful statement. He understands that, that we're praying and, and there should be only one fold, only one church, because there's only one chief shepherd. There's only one Lord who's the head of the church. And that's a marvelous statement when you consider where he is and his mindset and the things that he has been taught and going through. That's on page 14. Oh, that ministers and people would be, uh, would, would, but consider that there are no divisions in the grave nor in that world which lies beyond. There are divisions must come to an end. Now, granted, he's not given an expose on the Hadean world. And basically, he's looking at everyone who is, quote, uh, say they believe in Jesus. But I still put this in the positive things because it says there shouldn't be divisions in people who are following Jesus. And then there are some propositions in the Declaration Address, and I put the first one in there. It says that the Church of Christ upon earth is essentially, intensely, and constitutionally one, consisting of all those in every place that profess their faith in Christ and obedience to him in all things to the scriptures and that manifest the same by their tempers and conduct and of none else as none can be truly and appropriately called Christians. Page 18 and page 19. When you think of that statement, that the church of Christ on earth is essentially, intensely, and constitutionally one. Now the guys in the book, they take that and go from a different direction, but we'll look at that here also. And you think about that statement, that's truly the Lord's church. As long as you're following the Bible, you're in the Lord's church, it's one. It's one. Union in truth has been and ever must be the desire and prayer of all such. Unity and truth is our motto, page 23. Now back then they would use the term union and unity as synonymous terms. We understand that there's a difference between union and there's a difference between unity. Brother Marshall Keeble taught us that a long time ago when he said you can take two cats and tie their tails together and throw them over a clothesline. You will have uni uh, union, but you will not have unity. But 
but we need to cut them a little slack on some terms at that point in time. And that was on page 23. Our humble desire is to be his standard bearers, fight under his banner and with his weapons, which are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, even all these strongholds of divisions through partition walls of separation. And I believe he's addressing denominationalism there. And that is a powerful statement, considering where he is in his development. That there is no divisions among them, but that they all uh, walk by the same rules, speak the same thing, and be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, page 14. Are we not all praying for that happy event when there will be one fold as there is one chief shepherd, and that's close to what I'd already quoted, but it's different. He just reworded it in page 14. And the declaration address, I think, is quite wordy. It seems as though if he could have said a few things and just put his pen down, it'd have been a whole lot better. But he just kept going and going and going. Get it and read it, and if you think I'm wrong, let me know. Ministers of Christ, we can neither be ignorant of nor unaffected with divisions and corruptions of his church, page 15. Now, aren't these principles that we should look at, that we can learn from, principles to point us back to Christ, principles to point us back to the New Testament, principles to point us back to the pattern that is set forth in the New Testament for the Lord's church, yes. But now... Let's look at some denominational principles in the Declaration and Address. The establishment of the Christian Association at Washington, I read these, but I'm going to reread them, at a meeting held at Buffalo, August 17, 1809, consisting of persons of different religious denominations to form themselves into a religious association, page 2. And then in page 4, that we form ourselves into religious association under the denomination of Christian Association of Washington. In other words, at one point in the Declaration of Address, they're not forming a new denomination, and then on page four, they are forming themselves into a denomination of the Christian Association of Washington, and that's unscriptural. That's unscriptural. Page three, brethren, throughout all churches, as would restore unity, peace, and purity to the whole church of God. Now that is unity and diversity. Brethren, throughout all churches, Churches, he's talking about through all denominations. Some of these fellas that uh, you've been reading about their books just so far in this lectureship would agree with that statement, that there are brethren in all churches. I disagree with that statement. It's denominational. Okay. Page four, that this society consider it a duty and should use all proper means in its power to encourage and to uh, the formation of similar associations. In other words, they're not content just to forming the, the, the association, Chris Association of Washington. They want different groups to form similar associations throughout the land. Now, doesn't logic teach you that that's just forming more different denominations? You'd have to take it to the most reasonable conclusion. As Brother Warren said, you just examine the evidence and draw the conclusion that the evidence demands. And basically, in those terms, he's saying, well, let's form more of these. And that's, and that's error. That's error. The cause that we advocate, is it not our peculiar, not the cause of any party? Consider as such, it is a common cause of Christ and our brethren in all denominations. Page 10. To this we call, we invite our brethren of all denominations by all the sacred motives which we have avowed as the impulsive reasons of thus addressing them, you are all, dear brethren, equally included as the object of our love and esteem. With you all, we desire to unite in bonds of an entire Christian unity. And you, and you wonder why these people who say they are following Campbell come up with the idea that there are brethren in all denominations and they want to be united with them. 
Well, they're just, they're just following their leader. They're just following their leader. But we need to remember where their leader was at the time when he wrote that. Because later on in his life, he's not espoused these principles that he put forth in his declaration and address. Unite with us in the common cause of simple evangelical Christianity. In this glorious cause, we are ready to unite with you. United, we will prevail. Now that is simply unity and diversity. Page 16. This, we are persuaded, is a uniform sentiment of real Christians in every denomination. Union in truth has been and, and ever must be desire and prayer of all such. Union in truth is our motto, page 23. But he does not understand the full import of the statement. When he's saying union in truth, we should be united in truth, shouldn't we? Sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. We should all be united on that. But there's such a maze in the denominational world then as there is now. And he is basically implicating that they all just come together. And they can unite on truth. Now in that debate I had with the guy in Ohio, uh, in the debate he, uh, uh, we had some questions and he checked that true that one must be baptized for remission of sins to be saved. And uh, I approached him because just so happened that week before, Ricky and I were out walking, and I found a bulletin from his church on the ground, almost like somebody had slung it there, you know, for me to pick up. And in the bulletin that week, he was going to preach at the Nazarene church. Well, I asked him, I said, you said here that person must be baptized for the remission of sins or they're not saved, and you put T for true, when you go to the Nazarene church, do you tell them they're in sin, that they need to be baptized for the remission of sins? Well, he got all mad and all fluffed up at me, like I was the most evil thing that ever walked the earth. And he says, well, if they just call the name of Jesus, that's fine enough for me. And I have a feeling that this is probably the idea that Campbell was talking about, although you can't say it because it's not in so many words, but you have to see what he is saying and where he is at this point in time. Now, the denominational principles in the appendix of the Declaration Address. It seems as though he wrote the Declaration Address, and some accused him of latitudinalism, and I'm not pronouncing that word right, and I guess he's just talking about moving people from one uh, denomination to the next denomination. He says, we beg leave to assure our brethren that we have no intention to interfere either directly or indirectly with the peace and order of settled churches by directing our ministerial association, page 28. Well, as a gospel preacher, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to be on record. I have a mission to affect the peace and order in denominations. I don't want to cause a little bit of anxiety in denominations because I want them to see the truth. And I want them to be saved. We dare not therefore patronize the rejection of God's dear children because they, have not, uh, they may not be able to see alike in matters of human inference. Now, Brother Hightower would say, set up and listen, boys. He's introducing new hermeneutics. to see a like in matter of human inference of private opinion, such as we esteem all things not explicitly revealed and enjoined in the word of God, page 31. Now we're going to put a peg there, and I'm going to pick that up when we get a closer look at this. Because basically he's saying there, you cannot judge someone by inference. The only thing that you can judge someone is on just a direct statement. Like that. No man has the right to judge his brother except so far as he manifestly violates the express letter of the law. And that's on page 33. And basically, that's what the new hermeneutics You can't judge me by inferences or by implications unless it's just an express uh, 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 breaking of God's law where he just says it so many words. Well, now let's look at the one true church. I had to lay the foundation 
for the declaration address where we got to the one two church the uh, bicentennial celebration of Thomas, Thomas Campbell's declaration address by Glenn Thomas Carson and by the way he's the head of the uh, uh, Historical Society of Nashville Douglas A. Foster and Clinton J. Holloway editors. Their view of the restoration in America is overwhelmed by blind emotional fervor. I'll repeat that. Their view of the restoration in America is overwhelmed by blind emotional fervor. Championing that which is not from God's words and many times taking leaders of the restoration out of context to prove things they did not teach or had not fully come to complete knowledge of at that time in their life. In other words, there's a lot of things that Campbell taught in here that's error. But remember, he's just taking baby steps. Let's put it this way. How many of you have children? I want to raise, let's see some hands raised. Grandchildren. And if you don't have children, grand, how many of you have nephews and nieces? There you go. Have you ever seen a little baby when they're first taking their first step? Maybe daddy or mama, they got the baby under his arms and they step back a little bit. And say, Come on, take that step. Come on, take that step. And the little baby's ears jiggling and eyes are going in every different direction. He takes a step. Come on, take another, take another step. And they just fall down. Just fall down. Campbell is taking baby steps in the Declaration Address and principles of going back to New Testament Christianity. These guys look to where he falls down and they base their teaching from where he falls. We would take this and look at the principles that point back to the Bible in those baby steps away from era and we say, hey, that's good. That is marvelous. And these guys are blind to those baby steps. It'd be like a, 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 a mother or, or a father, and they see the baby, and it's walking, it's taking steps, and it falls down. They get so excited because it fell down. Oh, I'm glad you did that. And that's basically what these guys are. Holloway said the Declaration Address has been called many things. A hundred years ahead of its time. A clarion call for reformation. Our fundamental document, the Magna Carta and the movement, uh, Magna Carta of the movement, the source of our DNA. Page 15. Let's flip. Now, the clarion call, in fact, that's what I call my bulletin, the Gospel Clarion. And the clarion is just simply a very distinctive sound. This has distinctive sounds for restoration. It also has distinctive sounds for error. And it also muddies the ground. Now, but don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to insult Campbell. Where he was at this time, you know, I wouldn't have been smart enough to figure out some of the things he's doing. Not coming from his background. And we need to respect his steps that he took back to New Testament Christianity. But we also need to know where he stood and where he fell so that we don't fall. First, the fundamental document for the Church of Christ is the New Testament. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God can have complete knowledge of God. And the D and A for the church is not the declaration and address. It's the blood of Christ in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Why would anybody claim to follow Jesus Christ Say that the declaration address is the clarion call and, the, and that the declaration address is the DNA for the church. 
Well, that's blasphemous. Standing right up in the face of God and saying, well, your son's not good enough for me. I'm going to look Thomas Campbell. Now, that's what their implications are. Until men halt their advancement away from the scriptures, there can be no true unity. Period. Now let's get back to the new hermeneutics. I was talking with Brother Terry lately, and y'all been picking on him. You shouldn't. Terry, you're a man of intellect and mass vocabulary, and the rest of us are just jealous. <laughs> the authors of the one church seek to advance a new hermeneutic to change the makeup of the church to accept any religious doctrine. They said, and this is on page 252 of the book, so what has been taught us to set, or what has brought us to such division? As Thomas Campbell rightly points out, many of our church systems come because of hermeneutics, ways of understanding and interpreting the scriptures. On page 52, they says inferences and deductions from scriptures are not binding. Well, that's what Campbell said in Reparation Evidence. In fact, when I was reading the book, and, and, and I did read it, you know, if you want to see my little highlights and markings and stuff, it's there. I was reading this, and I said, surely they're not quoting him directly, correctly. And so I, first I, I called to see if anyone had the uh, first edition of the Declaration of Rest and finally found it on the Internet, and printed it off because I wanted a paper copy of it. And I looked to what they said Campbell was saying, and lo and behold, he said it. But this is at the points where he was falling and not walking towards uh, the Bible. First, inferences or implications are binding. Brother Hightower mentioned and gave some examples of that last night. I'm going to give you some more today. You didn't think I was going to quit from saying he did it. No. Turn your Bible, if you would, to John and, or to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, we have Jesus in a discourse with the Sadducees. And you know the setting of the Sadducees here, they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in afterlife. And so they set up this little argument, like a straw man argument. And they said, well, this man had a wife, and he died. And according to the Leverett Law, his brother married him, and he died. And that happened seven times. And guess, well, which one of those men uh, was uh, she husband to in the afterlife? Well, they didn't believe in the afterlife. And, and you kind of got the feeling that these guys have put some Pharisees on the horns of the limb in that. You know, I, I can't prove it, but, but I doubt if this is the first time they used that argument. And Jesus said, in verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, or the old King James says, You do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, you have, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the living. And that's a quote from Exodus chapter 3, verses 6 and verse 15. And you'll go back there, and you're not going to see where it says that there is a resurrection from the dead or an afterlife. But when God said, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob, he was implying that they're still alive. Now there's implication. Used by the Lord. And the Sadducees, well, I guess they could be like these boys say, well, you know, we just can't bind anything by inferences and implication. Let's look at another one. Turn to John chapter 8, if you would. John chapter 8, this is where Jesus is having a discourse with the Pharisees. I, we took on the Sadducees, we might as well take on the Pharisees too. 
and Jesus is teaching them some marvelous things. But I want to uh, just read some verses here, verse 23, and he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Now I want you to focus in on the I am, used twice in that verse. Okay, Verse 24, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And that he is italicized, in other words, it's not there in the original Greek. So let's just read it without the he. Therefore I said to you that you shall die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Well, they didn't quite get it. He keeps on teaching. And in verse 28, Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, and when you, then you will know that I am he, leave out the he, then you will know that I am and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. Jesus is teaching by implication. Is Jesus saying that he is God? Yes. Now how do I know that? Let's just keep reading. Get over to the end of the chapter in verse 58. And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. Now these old boys back there, they understood teaching by implication. Now it doesn't say, now you're teaching us by implication and that doesn't count. The next verse says, and they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. They understood what Jesus was implying, that he's deity. So the Bible teaches by implication. And as many said, Paul Vaughn, your name's not in the Bible. So I have to infer God's implication that it applies to me. It applies to me. Well, the liberal element in the church is working overtime to revamp Christianity. Now, I'm not talking about these guys. They're not in the church. Now, don't anybody misunderstand me here, okay? I'll get the back to these guys in a second. But the liberal element in the church is working overtime to revamp Christianity, and they're using some of the same arguments of these guys. <laughs> and they even go back and point to what Campbell wrote, both senior in, in Alexandria, and they'll go back to, to Stone. And like I say, those men were giants in that they were reading themselves out of air. They didn't have the blessings we have today. They, they couldn't go to McGarvey's commentary. Or they couldn't go to uh, uh, the Gospel after commentary, to leave off Revelation. They couldn't go to David Brown and say, David, teach me about New Testament Christianity. Or Dub McClish, Dub, you, you're pretty good on this. Open my eyes. Teach me. I want to learn. They just read and they were exegetes of God's word. They read out God's message. These guys are exegetes. They take what Campbell said when he fell down and tried to read it into God's message. You see. But the liberals in the church today are trying to do just exactly what these guys are only about. They're about 50 years ahead of the rest of them. All you have to do is look at church history and you're going to see it. 50 years from now, you might hear some in the, in the, uh, that are faithful Christians today or the grandson or children of faithful Christians today coming out with, with error like this and, and trying to force that on the church. It is the goal of the writers of the one church to be united with all denominations. Well, that was the goal of Thomas Campbell when he wrote the Declaration Address, at least in part of it, to be united with all denominations. The echoes of their heresies is being sounded throughout many of the Lord's church. It sickens me when Christians say that there are Christians in all denominations. It can't be, at least not faithful Christians. It's not going to happen. 
It sickens me when we have the pure simplicity scriptures and we're smart enough to read it. We're smart enough to go to it. We're smart enough to understand it. And then we think that we can not be baptized for remission of sins or not take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week or use mechanical instruments of music and worship and still be pleasing to God. They go to the restoration leaders writing to prove their arguments that do not prove a thing. They are highly educated men. And by the way, these guys are highly educated. You know, I was just looking at, at their pedigrees and, and from what I've seen, most of them got doctor's degrees. Now, these are earned doctor's degrees. They're not bought doctor's degrees. I guess that's another lesson altogether, isn't it? They're not, they're not idiots. They're not stupid men. Don't ever underestimate your enemies. Now, how are they my enemies? Because they're an enemy of God. Now, I love them enough that I'm going to teach the truth. But anyone's an enemy of God's my enemy. Because I want to be on God's side in all things. Thomas Campbell, in writing a declaration and address, said many great principles pointing to the Bible. He also did not fully understand the results of those principles at that time in his life, but he grew out of the era. And see, that's the key. He grew out of the era, at least most of them. Wicked men take the air of Campbell that Campbell taught and they try to deceive the church today and they know better. And I can hear it today. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Paul. Mighty fine lesson today. For those who don't know, Brother Paul Vaughn is uh, well versed in restoration history. He has done extensive study in the past and spoken several times on the subject of restoration history, so I believe he handled this subject today very well. There's only one statement, though, that I would have to, uh, I don't know if necessarily agree, disagree with, but be cautious about. Terry's used to people insulting him. He's not used to receiving compliments. <clears throat> I believe I saw him shake a little bit when you gave him the compliment. You ready to surprise him every time? Maybe. <laughs> I do believe the elders need to get together and they need to... Well, they need to have a discussion amongst themselves about maybe getting some heavy equipment in to remove a wall because his head is swelled up so big now, there's no door here that, that he could fit his head through. So they may need to discuss uh, bringing heavy equipment in to remove one wall to get him out of the building this evening. on that. I don't think I could have said that better myself. I don't believe David could have either. <laughs> that was good. We will stand adjourned for the next 10 minutes. We do have open forum coming up next. If you have not submitted a question, again, the paper is on the front. You can do so. By the way, if you are watching via the internet, you can also email a question uh, that will be discussed. We don't know that we'll get to that question today, but uh, sometime this week, if we have the time, we'll get to those questions as well. So if you're watching by the internet, also have the opportunity to submit questions. Uh, stand adjourned now for the next 10 minutes. <laughs>